And good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you and be the first of several voices that you'll hear. And to first introduce my co-presenters, Hannah Weissman, Emily Gifford-Smith, Sula Molina, and Isabella Nugent, who together with me are going to share some experiences and learnings and questions coming out of a course we did last semester called Education, Technology, and Society. So in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to say a couple of things to frame the course and to let you know what you can expect from this hour, which we hope will end with a decent chunk for Q&A and exchange. So first, let me just say that while we're conversing here, we're inviting a Twitter back channel um, using hashtag Ed255. If you don't know what I'm talking about, let it go. And if you do, know that you're welcome to join. If you have a device with you, as Hannah said, we won't consider it rude. And we'll actually be engaging one of the swirls of cultural change, swirls of fear and hope that circulate when we endeavor to uh, thin the boundary between social media and formal ed in a range of institutional and extra institutional spaces. Um, there on the Twitter back channel, you might meet some other members of this mighty team that brought this course to life. And I'm just going to say a couple words of acknowledgement and thanks. First to Jenny Sporer, who really gave guidance and leadership to the grant, to Esther Chang and Elizabeth Riley, who brought great heat and light um, as instructional technologists to some of this endeavor. To Evan McGonigal, who first um, shared a conversation with me about um, intervening in Wikipedia um, and really starting to t dismantle some uh, assumptions about the neutral point of view that Wikipedia makes such a fuss over while at the same time being so largely white male and Eurocentric to this day, but more about that in times to come. And also acknowledging that the grant that I got, which let me revise this class with a focus on four focal social media platforms, allowed me to invite four um, guides, specialists from outside the course to travel with us. Two are Bryn Mawr alums, Jen Rachel and Maggie Powers, now working in digital archiving and technology coaching, respectively, one in an elementary school, one at a college. And the two others um, are a doctoral student, um, Matt, uh, Monica Sengel Jones, a doctoral student at UCSD in the history of technology, and Mino Rami, who is um, a well known Philadelphia public school teacher um, who made Twitter a space for her public intellectual work and is now serving as a Gates Fellow in Seattle. So before I turn it over to um, these amazing students, I just want to share that. The course focused on some central inquiries. I've listed them here and I won't repeat them. But I'll just say more broadly, the course sort of worried and also worried about and delighted in um, what's up when people talk about social media as a space of participatory culture. What's up when at once social media is corporate, public, personal, effervescent and lasting, and why should we care? Sort of what's at stake, and how can we get smarter with a range of sort of discursive and experiential moves about engaging in a way that's both sort of um, dubious and also curious. So the course goals are here, and I'll just say one more thing, which is that as in most ed courses, the course goals here arise out of the fact that our courses partner with a number of community partners, schools and other educational settings where our students study. So our endeavor is always to marry experiential and academic learning and to put them into creative and sometimes 
creative conversation and sometimes disequilibrium. So the projects you're going to hear about come out of relationships with field partners in a range of settings and the students will be speaking about them with pseudonyms, um, institutions and individuals to protect their privacy. So again, welcome. Um, so each of us had a central project that we worked on over the course of the semester. Some of them um, were in um, more conventional locations. Some of them were in very unconventional locations. Um, and we were able to um, learn from our own projects and from projects with others um, how uh, questions of the interaction between technology and education um, arose in these different situations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my project. Um, I had a more conventional placement location. I was in a local fourth grade classroom and I led a blogging project with a group of students. Um, I had worked with this teacher last year in another education class. Um, so I was building off um, like material that we had already worked on together, we'd already done a blog together, and what we wanted to do this year um, was we wanted to um, create a curriculum for the students that really helped them engage um, online in a meaningful way. Um, so, um, Ms. Burnett, who's the, that's the student pseudonym that I'm going to use for the teacher. Ms. Burnett and I worked together to brainstorm a curriculum that would push students not only to improve their writing skills, which they can get from a traditional assignment, but also how to learn how to interact in an online forum, which is a new skill that is increasingly important. Um, and we wanted to introduce that in a formal way in the classroom. Um, we began by talking about the importance of pen names online, particularly as we were working with minors. These are just fourth graders. Um, so we talked about um, authors who used pen names and why they might have done that. Um, and each student came up with um, their own pen name. So the example post that I have up here, um, the pen name that this student came up with is Sanjay Kumar. Um, and, and some of them were a little sillier, some of them were a little more serious, and they really took on these identities um, as these online roles. Um, we started out with uh, prompts that were more similar to the schoolwork they'd already been doing. So for example, um, they had each been reading an assigned reading book for class, so we started out with some questions about the book that they'd been reading, making connections, um, using skills that they'd already been using, and we slowly branched out um, so that these students could explore more of the opportunities one would get writing online as opposed to just writing um, as you would in a traditional classroom setting. Um, so this post um, we did in November for Thanksgiving, it was, a post on, it was an exercise about gratitude where each student came up with something that annoyed them and then they turned it around and talked about why they were grateful for that thing. So this student wrote, it annoys me when I'm sick and my mom says I'll feel better after I sleep at night and I don't. Um, <laughs> and um, goes on once he flips it to say that I'm thankful that I have someone who takes care of me and has experience treating sick people and can help me. Um, so. Um, um, first of all, this, al this allowed the students to, to uh, think about things creatively in a different way than usual. You're not, um, they weren't um, doing the same sort of analyses that they would do, um, like reading an assigned reading book in class. Um, and this gave a forum for this type of um, more creative, fun, critical thinking. Um, and then at the end of the semester, they each wrote um, a post on their blogging experience. And I thought that this student, the cookie jar, summed it up really well. Um, he wrote, blogging has been a fun experience for me. I'd never done it before, and I was hoping it would be fun. I enjoyed writing book reviews and writing about photos, and it was exciting having friends read your work. Um, having our friends read our work also helped us improve our writing skills. I hope in the future we will take more pictures and write about them and also write about books. I had a fun time with blogs, and I hope we can continue blogging. Um, and so each student wrote a post 
sort of in this vein. And it was really fun to see like each of them identified specific things that they felt like they really gained um, from this experience. Um, and one thing in particular that stuck out that I was really hoping that they would get from the project um, was um, that they were each commenting on each other's posts. So every student in the class commented um, on other people's posts. And we also um, had people who were just online reading these students' work and commenting. Um, and it was really exciting for these students to feel like they were participating in a larger forum, in a larger way, and that they were able to interact with um, a large group of people, that their voice was being heard. Um, whereas in a traditional assignment, it's usually just you and your teacher. Um, in this way, they could bounce ideas off each other and work together and feel like that they were presenting something that had some value to other people. Um, so this semester, Ms. Burnett is continuing the project, which is super exciting. The students have already written a couple posts. Um, and I am just so happy to watch the blog continue to blossom. Um, and um, um, I uh, really felt like I got what I was looking for out of this project, and I learned so much. And in particular, what uh, I felt like the most valuable takeaway was I helped these students um, learn how to um, gain their voice through writing online. So through writing a blog, um, they were able to get richer engagement with the resources available online. Um, they were able to work together with others, as I was saying. Um, and they were able to see the value in their voice because they're participating in a larger conversation um, and, what, and building skills that will serve them well. Um, as they grow up in an age where technology is so important. And I'm going to pass it off now to Emily. So I also had a more conventional placement. I was in a high school in, with um, Mia, who could not be here today. Um, and we were working in a ninth grade English class, although it didn't start out like that. Um, we originally went to the meet with the principal and several of the teachers to sort of talk about how we might be most effective and what our class, what our experience in our classroom here could bring to our work at the school. Originally, our project was going to take the form of us revitalizing their Facebook and Twitter accounts and, and potentially introducing an Instagram account to sort of teach the faculty and the administration how they could use that to reach out to the parents and other community members and to celebrate a lot of the academic and sometimes athletic achievements of their students. It didn't work out the way we wanted to. Um, we had to do a lot of restructuring of the project. Um, as, we, as Mia and I became more and more inspired by the work we were reading about in class and particularly our, the consultant Minu Rami's um, work with Twitter, we really felt that there was a bigger way, a bigger impact that we could have. So we decided to work with Twitter and teaching with Twitter. Um, and this was, for me personally, kind of a hard um, adjustment because I had always looked at Twitter as kind of a frivolous social media, fun, not so academic, didn't have a place in the classroom tool. I'm so happy that I was wrong. <laughs> um, because it has been one of the most incredible journeys working with this teacher in particular who really took it and ran with it in ways that me and I probably didn't anticipate. Um, so here are what we did. Let me backtrack, backtrack a little bit. What we did is we asked all of the students to set up an academic Twitter account. We didn't want them to use their own Twitter accounts because we didn't want to, we wanted to. Um, respect the school's privacy and um, rules about what, was what they felt was appropriate for their students to be involved with on social media. So we had them create their own academic Twitter accounts that they would use solely for this class, or if it grows in the future, <laughs> anything related to their work in high school. Um, we also had the teacher create an account and a hashtag for each of his classes. So here we have, they were working with the Odyssey. Um, so we have a hashtag that's hashtag Odyssey402, and anyone in the 402 class used this hashtag to participate in the conversation that we were having that day about Odyssey, the Odyssey um, online. What it ended up, what it turned out to be, we were only in the classroom for two days, which was kind of hard because we had a lot of ideas that we wanted to share and work with. Um, but it ended up 
as a test run, we did a lot of quizzes, like um, who delivered the message to, message to Calypso telling her to let Odysseus go. And um, originally, the, the students were saying, well, there was some colorful language I'll leave out, but um, <laughs> they're like, we don't want to do this. This is stupid. Who uses Twitter in the classroom? But by the end of the class, because we had, we had a screen up, so we were um, projecting the conversation as we were working with Twitter in the classroom. Um, they were asking me to refresh the page, or Mia to be, refresh the page so that they could see their answer, answers and see themselves actively participating in the conversation. So that was really exciting to see. Um, the other thing that happened after we left um, was the, uh, the teacher, Mr. Smith, um, is uh, asking his students to tweet pictures of the Cyclops. And I logged on in a whim, on a whim to see if it had kept going. And I was pleasantly surprised again by how excited he was to share all of this and to use Twitter as a tool. Um, so that was very rewarding. Hopefully, I will, I'm a senior English major. I mean, yes, that's true. I'm also <laughs> a senior. <laughs> That's relevant in a second. <laughs> a senior education minor, and I am finishing off my the capstone in education 311 class, which is a fieldwork seminar. Hopefully, in the same location with the same teacher, and we'll continue to grow our work with Twitter. Um, so, inspiring that, I found during Tech Education Society the hashtag #ingchat, um, in which teachers from around the world and even around um, nope around the country and even around the world <laughs> um, are contributing to this collective conversation about how other teachers are using um, Twitter in their classroom or simply sharing teaching strategies or lessons that they've used that have been successful or not so successful. And it was just an incredible resource for me, an aspiring English teacher, to come across. So thank you, Alice. <laughs> and I'll turn it over to you. Great. So, I'm Sula. I had a very different experience than a traditional classroom setting. Um, along with my partner Amanda, who's abroad right now, um, we were partnered with a senior center in the area that's really focused around um, the health and wellness and kind of an active lifestyle for its, for its participants. Um, and the idea originally was a big, really exciting plan where we were going to develop an app that was going to allow um, members at the center to track their health records um, with the understanding that there are a lot of issues in terms of especially senior citizens having control over their own records and feeling like when they go to the doctor, they know all of their medications, they're laid out easily in a, an easy to read format so that they can present them to a healthcare provider, whether that's somebody they've been seeing for a while or a new person. Um, we quickly realized we didn't have the technical skills to do that, and there were also many, many privacy restrictions for fairly obvious reasons about collecting people's medical records, um, especially us as college students. Um, <laughs> and people across the board who are making similar apps all have similar problems. Um, so essentially what we decided to do was that we would take an existing list of apps that were highly rated and we would select one that we thought was most appropriate for the members who were interested. Um, but we really wanted it to be a participatory process. We wanted this to really encourage, since the purpose of the project overall was improving agency on the part of the members, we wanted them to have agency in the selection of the app. Um, so the way we did that was first by creating a needs assessment, which is right here. Um, quite small, so I'll read some of it out loud. Um, and essentially we went through when we were selecting the apps ourselves and looked at the different characteristics they offered, um, the different features they had, and then we asked the members um, how important those features were so that we could select which app we would move forward with. So things like having it function on a variety of different electronic devices, some were available um, just on I iPhones um, or Windows phones, and so some were available also on a computer which was generally a more accessible larger screen. Um, and then whether it was fairly low cost or free, um, if it had a clear and user-friendly interface. Um, and so not very surprisingly, when we got some of these back, everybody wanted all of the good stuff. <laughs> so it <laughs> didn't help us that much in that way. We just decided to move forward with what we thought had the most of these characteristics to begin with. Um, but what was really interesting and was particularly surprising to us was the big what appeared to be a language gap or a barrier in the way that we were communicating about technology with a generation of people who didn't grow up with it in the same way. Um, simple language around 
things like signing in or usernames, um, especially things about privacy were a big issue and that created a lot of anxiety clearly in the way that people were responding um, in terms of storing your data securely, for example, just within your physical device as some apps do, um, whereas some apps would share these in a kind of remote server that existed on the internet, which is scary for everybody. <laughs> it's a big thing that's out there. Um, so what we realized actually where most of the uh, educational kind of aspect of this would come in um, was both in training the seniors at the center to use the app, but also just how to begin. Um, because from our own experience with elderly people and technology, um, what can be most intimidating and what can create the biggest barrier in terms of access is just getting started. Um, so we wanted to create a video that would set members up with um, an introduction to the app, just simply creating an account. Um, and that can be a really overwhelming thing, so we wanted to include a glossary of terms, and we ended up using, we kind of created a toolkit that included a glossary of terms, um, a starter video for getting signed up on the app, and then a series of other videos we had found that already were out there in terms of how to use the app. So things like home page, sign up, sign in, username, uh, we presented these in the toolkit. Um, and so we had been thinking a lot about how technology was useful in encouraging education and making it easier, but we hadn't thought so much until we started doing this and realized what was there in terms of a language gap, um, the ways that technology could impede education or stop people from wanting to participate at all, especially if ed uh, technology wasn't part of somebody's everyday life in the way that it already probably would be for a younger student. So. Here's the video we made. I'm just going to play it in the background on mute, but there's a voice in the background. Um, so we, we use this cool screen, screencast-o-matic to capture the screen um, while we slowly walked through the process of creating an account. Um, and Amanda's in the background speaking slowly. We really wanted to emphasize the kind of personal aspect of teaching because we didn't have an opportunity due to the times that certain classes were happening at the center and when we were available to actually go to the center and teach. Um, but we thought another great element of a video was that it was something people could always return to. They could always have access to it and especially with memory issues in an older population, you could always come back to it if you forgot. Um, so we created this, we really wanted it to be personal and friendly because we knew that technology can seem to everyone so impersonal and often very cold and distanced from humanness. Um, so we created this um, and we had been talking in class about this text, Natural Born Cyborgs by Andy Clark, and kind of this idea that um, Clark argues that people have a natural and really remarkable tendency to reach to extend themselves through technology, and that that extension is actually really a natural one, um, to the point where the line between humanity and technology becomes very blurred, especially more recently with more advances in technology. Um, and what we thought we were seeing here with the kind of anxiety around especially privacy issues was that people, seniors, were feeling like if they gave part of their humanity, part of their medical information out to technology, it would be lost and that agency would be gone. They would no longer have control over their own information. Um, so a lot of our attempts to make things more personal and to make things more comforting and kind of have a cohesive toolkit to make people feel comfortable with starting was that um, they would see that actually, at least in the case of a trusted app like the one we chose, you could be gaining a lot more agency than you would be losing in putting your information out there. And that ultimately, the purpose the app was serving was for you to hold those things in your own hands when you walked into the doctor's office. So I'm going to hand this off. Um, hello everyone. Uh, the placement I was given was unique in two ways. Uh, one was the fact that it took place in Tamale, Ghana, and two was the fact that I consider myself more a learner in this project than I was a teacher in a lot of ways. Um, the project was split into two areas, Wikipedia and social media. The Wikipedia portion involves, and I'm going to use the real name here because the whole project was about building online presence, so I'd love if you would look up the Wikipedia article was about um, promoting this alternative Ghanaian um, education system that was called, or education organization, I'm sorry, that was called Hopin Academy. Um, and my job was to create a Wikipedia article for this so that it, it would be given a sense of legitimacy. In my conversation with the head of the organization, I'll call him McCartney, um, to give the school a sense of legitimacy, that it was a real organization out there, it has its own Wikipedia article, it means something, it's doing something in the world. 
Um, but uh, through my series of fumbles as I was creating this new Wikipedia article, one of the rejections I received, one of many, uh, read, if you still feel that the subject is worthy of inclusion in Wikipedia, please rewrite your submission to comply with these policies. Um, and I concluded the username because that is a, um, that is a pseudonym already. Um, so when I first read this, I thought, I didn't really think that much of it. I thought, oh, okay, I guess it was, I didn't read, it wasn't in depth enough. I wasn't using the right language. I didn't prove in my own writing that this was an important school, that this mattered, this project mattered. Then I sat back and thought about it. I was like, this is incredibly messed up. Why is this subject not worth it? It's not my writing skills. Maybe it's the community of Wikipedia themselves. Maybe they don't appreciate what's going on and an individual's efforts to improve the education system from his own city. So um, I did some more research on other articles similar to the one I was writing. Um, the Haverford Friends School was, had an improved article. It was about three sentences long. Um, mentioned something about it was a school in Haverford that was from grades like one through eight and that was improved to be an article but the one I was writing was not. So um, we talked a lot in class about what the Wikipedia community is like. Um, Wikipedia's image to the outside world is that of a site that's not reliable enough to use for your homework, but maybe reliable enough to win an argument with your friend, um, which, is, which is a lot. It's, it's a lot to say, uh, well, it's on Wikipedia. Well, so it's true. Um, I'm right. I won. So it does mean a lot to have a Wikipedia article. Um, so at the same time, we did more investigation on who writes for Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia is actually, as you can see by this pie graph, 90% male, 9% uh, female, and 1% transgender. There's also a massive diversity gap, uh, something I couldn't find a pie, pie graph for, but it's mostly white male writers that are editing Wikipedia. So this information source that we rely on, pretty, uh, we rely on a lot of aspects in our lives, is being written by a very small niche of people, niche group of people. Uh, also a group of people that cannot, can often be not very friendly to new users, um, as illustrated in this quote above and also through our own is investigations in class as we are looking over um, articles that have been argued about with new editions. And oftentimes the way Wikipedia editors between themselves when an argument is by insults and by putting them down and saying, well, clearly you don't know the standards of Wikipedia. One of Wikipedia's main pillars is neutral point of view. Neutral point of view is the main pillar for a um, very niche group of white males. <laughs> Clearly bias is being <laughs> filtered here. So luckily, both with the help of McCarthy, I'm sorry, I'm McCartney, a uh, Ghanaian man, and my mentor for this project, uh, Monica, uh, Monica sh they, we both were able to create an article that I feel st stood on my, its own feet, an article I was proud of. If, even if no one else was, I was proud of the article. <laughs> and um, my female mentor, she was able to find a way for me to post the article without having go through the obstacles and challenges of having other Wikipedia article, Wikipedia editors approve it. So it was made live in November and is still live today. Um, it is also growing, so people have been going in and polishing it up, making it look more organized. Um, the article is also, although is an orphan, which means no other article is linked to it. So if any of you are making <laughs> an article in the future, I would love if you mentioned Hoffman Academy, if it was relevant. <laughs> And, um, but to this day, as people are still reviewing the article, I'm still worried that it'll be taken down, that it won't be able to stand on its own um, within the Wikipedia community. It's con uh, articles are constantly being under uh, review, whether it's worthy enough to stand Wikipedia. I, <laughs> I, though, will continue to defend this article and write more in the future, <laughs> despite the challenges. Um, and the second part, of my project, I'm sorry, um, was uh, our Tomlay, which is a social media project created uh, by the same man, uh, McCartney, who wanted to create his own version of Humans of New York, uh, as, which are many different accounts similar to Humans of New York in many cities, but he wanted to create it for Tomlay, Ghana, his own hometown where he knows and loves so many people in the town. Um, as I was beginning this project, I came back to a quote that I read over the summer with my experience with uh, Baiko Deloon Summer Action Research Fellowship. It was part of the article, How to Write About Africa, and I'll read it to you now. 
um, broad bro uh, brush strokes throughout are good. Avoid having African characters laugh or struggle to educate their kids, or just make do in mundane circumstances. Have them illuminate something about Europe or America and Africa. African characters should be colorful, exotic, larger than life, but empty inside, with no dialogue, no conflicts, no resolutions in their stories, no depth or quirks to confuse the cause. This article is a parody, a uh, uh, witty article that explaining how so often we talk about Africa in the media, how we just don't give, we don't really tell the stories or illuminate the stories of African, of real Africans. Instead, we create these stereotypes and say they're true, and we just use them as uh, stepping stones to illuminate the white character, make them seem like the hero. Um, I was very nervous working with McCarthy, even though he offered me, he said, well, please help me with this project, I was nervous that I would not give truth to the stories being told, that I would somehow taint them and not make them real. Because something about the Humans of New York format was also kind of making me feel unsettled. Um, this unsettling feeling is uh, shown in this quote here in an article called Humans of New York, the Cavalier Consumption of Others. It also confirms a fact that seems to escape Stanton. That's the creator of Humans of New York. The, that the truest thing about a person, that a person's real story, is just as often the thing withheld, the silent thing, as the thing offered. So the argument in the article was that Humans of New York often makes people easily consumable, that the stories can be told in one quote, and that's proving their humanity somehow, as if their humanity has to be proven just because they're strangers, just because they look different than us. Um, this was something I didn't want the project to do. I felt very uncomfortable with the idea of like proving someone's humanity, of people, making people seem magical. Um, but through discussions with McCarthy, I was able to f be settled by this because the pro point of this project would not to be make people seem magical, but to prove that like a universal understanding of like ordinariness. That he was telling stories of his neighbors. He was pr showing how proud of he was of his friends. He wasn't trying to make people seem mystical or like incredibly wise, but just showing the truth of their lives. He was taking pictures of his friends going to school. They're in their own businesses. Um, letting them say what they wanted to say for the day, but not making it an uh, overarching statement about who they are as a person, but just showing what Tomale is like in a day-to-day. -day. So through um, Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook, and um, hopefully Twitter. I don't know how that format will work. We're still figuring that out. Um, we've been posting more pictures and stories about the people of Tomale and reaching out to a new audience. Um, I was really proud of how I was able to help break into the Instagram community and uh, build it up to make it a growing uh, Instagram with people commenting, oh, what a cute baby, and oh, keep posting, I love these pictures, Merry Christmas, I hope you all are doing well, and just kind of form a connection with my audience, that people are hearing these stories and getting something out of it, and breaking what we're, we so often see and what is illustrated in how to write about Africa. Thank you. Pass it over to Alex. <coughs> Thank you. Let's do it. You know, it's kind of a great job that I have here. Um, I'm going to just say a couple of things. Hey. Oh, here. Um, but before I do a brief conclusion and then um, we open it up to questions, I want to give a special thanks, um, which I saved, um, to the person who wa worked with us to architect and support the field placements, and that's Kelly Strunk, who's here. <laughs> I wanted you to see the spread of placements first you know, from an area independent school to a Philadelphia public high school to an internet hub in northern Ghana and um, a senior center in Ardmore. So it takes a lot of not only know-how but um, a delicacy to work with these placements and the students and the professor and so much appreciation. So it's really interesting how many, how social the class was, a class on social media, um, and how much um, of a team it feels like we are here and that we represent beyond. Um, so there's more 
layers of the kinds of investigations that we've made together, but I just want to say in the Q&A, you're welcome to ask any one of us a question and another one of us might jump in to add. So I'll just say a couple things. Um, I appreciated this line, um, and Emily, it probably was yours because you said a version of it today. It was in one of the course evals where a student wrote, I've never been more excited to be wrong, which like uh, made me really happy as a teacher. Um, so trying to sort of be less wrong about some of the affordances and barriers of working with social media and a, and a sort of serious educational endeavor today, um, some of the sort of cross-cutting takeaways are that sort of the nature of a successful project and how we recognize one changes with time. Um, that the question of what knowledge is common or common sense and who has access to it is extremely lively and like everybody's business. We spent one day in class the, um, when we were investigating Wikipedia talking about whether, to what degree we all who have access to enough bandwidth and so on, ha to what degree do we have responsibility to author in Wikipedia? Like, is it okay just to let that go along and not try to intervene? It's an interesting question how once things are alive, um, people might be vigilant. So Monica, our Wikipedia uh, guru, has continued to sort of mind the, the entry, as have some of us. Um, the students in Hannah's classroom were responding to each other in a sense that could be read as a form of accountability. I'm listening to you, I'm tracking what you're saying. You could see extensions of that. Um, in Emily's classroom, the, that some of this Odyssey study is happening on Twitter opens it to the possibility of other teachers breaking that isolation, which has long been a sort of wearying hallmark of the teacher reality, also opening to sort of response and responsibility. And so when Sula talks about how sometimes I might gain agency by giving something up, how does my decision to engage online and respond change the kind of responsibility I can take or ask of others? So these are the sorts of things we've been exploring. In addition to the idea fundamentally that different people, different groups, by virtue of where they are, bring different knowledges and importantly, I think, different silences to bear. Um, and again, in sort of the broader education project, you know, some of these questions have always been lively about who benefits, whose voices are heard, who's absent, who's silenced, who's imprisoned, who's killed. But now we have a, um, a more urgent warrant to explore them. So we're going to open up to questions. Yay. <laughs> and comments. Say backs. 